This will be a how I do it video describing a right-sided carotid endarterectomy performed in a 59-year-old gentleman with severe symptomatic right carotid stenosis. Brought to you by the Division of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery at St. Louis University. This patient was brought to the operating room and placed in the supine position. After general anesthesia was induced and preoperative antibiotics were administered, an arterial line was placed by anesthesia and cerebral perfusion monitoring pads were placed on his forehead for neuromonitoring via cerebral oximetry evaluation. The patient was further positioned by slight elevation of the head of bed to a beach chair position and placement of a rolled sheet under the patient's shoulders to induce a mild degree of neck extension with turning of the patient's head to the left, exposing his right neck. The patient was then prepped and draped from the midline to the lateral neck, superiorly to the bottom of the earlobe, and inferiorly to the nipples. This allows surgical access to the aortic arch if needed in an emergent situation. A longitudinal skin incision was made, overlying the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle with a 10-blade scalpel. This was deepened through the platysma with a combination of sharp dissection and electrocautery, exposing the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which was retracted laterally with the aid of a Wheatland retractor. Dissection continued along the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, revealing the underlying internal jugular vein. The facial vein was identified draining into the medial border of this structure. This was then dissected free and suture ligated using 2O silk ties. Further dissection was performed along the medial border of the internal jugular vein, revealing the common carotid artery. Using Metzenbaum scissors, the common carotid artery was carefully exposed and dissection superiorly revealed the external carotid artery with the superior thyroid artery branching medially. The bifurcation of the common carotid artery into the external and internal carotid arteries was revealed. The hypoglossal nerve was identified looping over the structure and preserved. The ansa cervicalis was also identified, extending along the anterior border of the carotid artery. This may be transected to improve exposure if necessary but was left intact in this case. The internal carotid artery was dissected free distally and controlled with a vessel loop. The external carotid artery was similarly controlled. and the superior thyroid artery was controlled with a POTS silk tie. A vessel loop was used to control the common carotid artery. At this point, the patient was prepared for carotid clamping. His blood pressure was increased with a systolic blood pressure greater than 130, and he was noted to be normocardic. There had been no bradycardia noted with dissection around the carotid bifurcation, and atropine was not necessary. The patient was systemically heparinized with 100 units per kilogram of IV heparin, 
and an activated clotting time was sent and found to be greater than 300. After allowing the heparin to circulate, the internal carotid, common carotid, and external carotid arteries were clamped in that respective order. A profunda clamp was used to clamp the internal carotid artery. An angled debakey clamp was used to clamp the common carotid. And the vessel loop controlling the external carotid artery was pulled taut to clamp this vessel. There were no changes noted in the cerebral oximetry after clamping, and this monitoring was continued to evaluate for any significant decrease greater than 20% from baseline. No change was seen on cerebral oximetry for the remainder of the case. An arteriotomy was performed on the anterior lateral surface of the common carotid artery with an 11-blade scalpel. This was extended into the internal carotid artery using pot scissors, being careful not to skive laterally. A subentimal endarterectomy plane was developed with a freer elevator between the muscular layers of the media. A right angle was placed in this plane, and the plaque was transected proximally in the common carotid artery. Eversion and darterectomy of the external carotid artery was performed, and residual debris was removed from the external carotid artery using tonsils. The external carotid artery was flushed with reasonable back bleeding noted. In the distal internal carotid artery, the plaque was feathered off and the plaque was removed. All remaining free debris and remnant circular media muscle fibers were removed with fine forceps and the endarterectomized surface was gently irrigated with heparinized saline solution. A bovine pericardial patch was brought onto the field while noting to place the smooth side of the patch on the interluminal side of the vessel. And the patch angioplasty was performed by initiating one 6-0 running proline suture on a BV needle from the apex of the internal carotid artery running towards the midpoint of the arteriotomy on both sides. The suture was followed by the assistant in order to allow the patch to be snugly opposed to the artery wall, with no redundancy in the bites. The patch was trimmed to the appropriate length and size. And a second 6-0 proline running suture was initiated from the common carotid artery origin of the arteriotomy. 
This suture was run toward the midpoint on both sides of the arteriotomy. The internal and external carotid arteries were back bled, and the common carotid was forward bled. The lumen was again irrigated with heparinized saline. The anastomosis was completed by tying the inferior and superior sutures at the midpoint on each side. Flow was reestablished by first unclamping the external carotid artery, followed by the common carotid artery, and then the internal carotid artery. The suture line was checked for hemostasis. Duplex evaluation revealed excellent flow through the common carotid, internal carotid, and external carotid arteries without any interluminal defects. All vessel loops and ties were removed and the wound inspected for hemostasis. Heparin was reversed by administering protamine sulfate and hemostatic agents in the form of flow seal were applied to achieve adequate hemostasis. After ensuring hemostasis, the platysma was closed with running thyrovicral suture. The skin was closed with foro monocle suture in a subcuticular fashion, and the incision was dressed with bioglue. The patient was later awakened and noted to have no gross neurological deficits with movement of all four extremities. This has been a How I Do It video describing a right-sided carotid endarterectomy brought to you by the Division of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery at St. Louis University.